Okay, so today we're going to talk about finding somatic mutations in cancer genome sequence data. And I'd like to begin with uh, a borrowed slide uh, from Mike Stratton um, that really describes how cells evolve over time and, and that they really accumulate uh, mutations somewhat stochastically over, over their lifespan. And occasionally those mutations, if you just, if it randomly happens to hit into a gene, that's a so-called driver gene, um, then that can initiate tumor genesis and the cell can become malignant. And so these cells go over, over time, undergo a process where their genomes change. So, um, so really, uh, the, the cancer arises from, from the endogenous cell itself. And, um, and, and this is something that is really quite important to understand, is that um, uh, mutations just accumulate over time. And as I said yesterday, that if we all live long enough, we'd likely all develop cancer of some kind. Um, and, and really, uh, so t tumors undergo a process of Darwinian evolution and under, uh, under selection, and where, where the individual is not, um, uh, is not a, an individual organism, but rather the individual cell. So you can really imagine this um, uh, process whereby cells' genomes change, and they undergo selection, and those uh, cells who have genomes that give them proliferative advantage will be selected for uh, throughout their life, life cycle. So really what we're after is to find mutations such as uh, this mutation here in, in P53. So this is a, an actual example from um, some data that I've been working with. Um, and and these, this, we believe, is a, is a tumor initiating event. And these are, so what we're focusing on today, um, as opposed to yesterday, are single nucleotide changes. So right at the base pair resolution of the genome. Yesterday we looked at larger changes, more than a KV, let's say, um, and today we're going to look at actual single nucleotide changes. So in this case, um, P53 is a, what we call a tumor suppressor gene, and, and, and defects or mutations in, uh, in P53 can allow cells to evade program cell death and, and DNA repair. So I'm going to show this slide again that um, I showed yesterday, and um, now I'll ask you to focus on, on the last component of this table. And these are genes, um, BRAF, KRAS, PI3 kinase, EJFR, um, whereby mutations in these genes are, are actually actionable by clinicians. So um, in KRAS, there's a particular mutation, codon 12, uh, for which there are targeted therapy. Um, and in melanoma, there's BRAF, um, uh, which is codon 600, and, and that um, there are RAF inhibitors for that particular mutation. So it's very advantageous to try to find mutations in cancers because eventually we can develop therapies against them. And especially if they're driver mutations, then that's, that's really a, a major goal of uh, what a lot of groups are doing right now internationally. So the way to find mutations is by sequencing genomes. And why, would, why should we want to sequence cancer genomes? Well, this figure here shows the classic um, paper from Hanahan and Weinberg that discusses the six hallmarks of cancer. I don't know if you've seen this figure in this workshop already. Um, yes, you have? Okay, great. So, so, so what wasn't covered, I'm not surprised by that, by the way, um, what wasn't really covered in this paper is, is what genetic abnormalities underpin the ability of, these, of tumor cells to achieve these oncogenic properties. And how do these, moreover, how do these genetic abnormalities change over the natural history of a tumor? And what genes and pathways are actually disrupted due to somatic genome aberrations? And these are all fundamental questions that underpin the mechanisms by which um, uh, tumors acquire their malignant state. So there have been uh, now just really an astounding number of uh, early successes um, with next generation sequencing applied to cancer. I would, uh, I would argue that 
Um, more than any other field, uh, cancer has benefited the most from sequencing technology because um, it is a disease of the genome. That's what cancer is. It's a disease of altered genomes. And in order to understand the cancers, we need to understand the genomes. And the way to understand genomes is by sequencing them. Okay? So, um, so there have been a number of, of recent discoveries. New cancer genes such as FOXL2, ARID1A, uh, EZH2, um, IDH1 mutations in, uh, in glioblastoma were discovered recently, um, PPP2R1A, um, and, and that whole complex has now been implicated in numerous cancers. Um, and uh, these are some studies that I've been involved in. There are many others as well. Um, we've also seen insights into tumor evolution. So really for the first time, we can now study how genomes change over time. So we can look at um, samples from a primary tumor and, say, a, a distant metastasis from in, 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 the, uh, in the ensuing years or a recurrence. Um, and we can compare those genomes and see how, how they're different or how, how similar or different they are and how those genomes may have changed under selection pressure of therapy. This is something that was inconceivable even uh, five or six years ago. So um, we've also gained enormous insights into the genomic architectures of cancer. So yesterday we, we looked at copy number changes and rearrangements, uh, I believe, as well. And, and really these two types of um, uh, uh, architectural changes really, really define um, the, the structure of the genomes. And what we've learned to appreciate by sequencing is that um, the genomes of, of many epithelial cancers are far more rearranged and far more uh, abnormal than we could have even imagined. And, and so this has led to uh, enormous new insights into, into the, to just studying the architectures of, 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 the, of the genomes of cancer. And really what all this leads to is uh, what I'm going to call the redefined mutational landscape. So mutational landscape of a tumor is really the full complement of mutations in a given tumor. Um, it describes what the tumor is. It defines it as a, with a fingerprint. Um, and really, um, up until now, there are about 100,000 mutations or so stored in cosmic. It's growing exponentially. Um, and and I, I predict that in the next three to five years, we'll see at least one, maybe two orders of magnitude um, in terms of uh, uh, number of mutations that are, that are found um, through this technology. And so, um, so groups like the International Cancer Genome Consortium and the Cancer Genome Atlas are really poised um, to completely rewrite the book on how we understand cancers from a mutational perspective. Um, so this is a very exciting time to be in this field. So a brief look at uh, sequencing technology, you've probably seen slides like this already. But um, essentially the way this works is that um, really next generation sequencing um, or high throughput sequencing as it will um, approaches single molecule sequencing. And DNA uh, are are anchored to uh, DNA fragments are anchored to uh, to molecules on a solid surface, and basically each each of these molecules is copied in situ by PCR um, to amplify what we call the template. And then essentially nucleotides are added um, one at a time in, in cycles, and the nucleotide that is uh, added on in a, in a massively parallel way is read by image analysis, and and really this. Um, this way of doing um, in situ type of PCR on, on a chip is, has, uh, on a flow cell, is what they call it in the Illumina, has really revolutionized the way that uh, sequencing can be done in, in a massively parallel fashion. And the throughput these days is quite staggering. Um, Five billion sequence reads at 100 base pair uh, uh, runs um, leads about 500 gigabases of sequence over and, and really over 150 fold haploid coverage in a matter of 10 days. So just to put this in perspective, I'm sure John went over this already, but this, this dwarfs the, the scale of the Human Genome Project um, just in a matter of days and for, uh, for $5,000. Pretty amazing. Um, okay, so in addition to cost and throughput, one of the real advantages for cancer is that because it approximates single molecule sequencing, um, we can actually read the proportion 
of alleles um, in a digital fashion in the sample. So say, for example, we have a tumor sample with 30% of the cells harbor a mutation. When we do our sequencing, 30% um, of the reads, approximately, will harbor that mutation. Um, and so we can get really precise measurements on uh, the abundance of mutations in our given samples. And this allows us to get at issues like mutational heterogeneity in a way that we could never have done before. So it's the digital nature of how this technology works that uh, gives it an additional advantage to cost and throughput. Okay. So we'll talk about this uh, a little later on as well. Okay, so here, here's a really, really simple um, and schematized uh, workflow uh, for how we might um, go about discovering uh, mutations whereby um, we obtain uh, reads in, a, in an unaligned form. And we use some sort of software to align the reads to the human genome. Mm -hmm. So when we get the data, we don't know where these reads actually come from in the genome. Um, this is basically a, a schematic of a paired end. I think you've probably gone over all this stuff, so I'll, I'll, just, um, I'll be quick about it. So, so we go from unaligned reads to aligned reads. Once we have our aligned reads, we, we try to find the features in, the, in our genome of interest um, that are different from the reference. And, uh, and so this is inference or predictions at this point. And for single nucleotide variants, um, what we usually do is, um, depending on the experimental design, uh, but we'll screen out known polymorphisms in a, in a cancer setting, because uh, for similar reasons to what we dis discussed yesterday. And then likely we'll, um, to try to pick the low-hanging fruit, um, we will likely screen out synonymous or, or non-coding mutations, because they're more, a little bit more difficult to interpret. Um, and so then what we're, what we're left with is a set of, of synonymous changes that affect um, the protein coding sequence of the gene that we're contained in. Okay? Um, and then uh, what's really important is to uh, initiate validation. So currently, um, the field in general, I don't think uh, we don't really understand all of the artifacts that this um, uh, technology produces. Just like any other genomics technology, and you've now you've gone through a few of them, uh, gene expression microarrays, uh, uh, high throughput genotyping arrays, and, and sequencing is no exception, there are machine-based artifacts. So anytime you, you engage in a high throughput type of activity um, that's generating a lot of data, there will almost certainly be artifacts. And sequencing is no exception, so we shouldn't be under any illusions that um, you're going to take your tumor sample and your normal match normal controlling and a sequence in both and you're going to be able to easily find all the mutations. That's not the case. So, so validation is quite important. We need to, you need to use um, some sort of orthogonal experiment to confirm the presence of your prediction. And, um, and, and usually there are three outcomes. So uh, a particular variant of interest could be confirmed as somatic. Um, often what we have is we we have the illusion of what looks like a somatic mutation, but turns out to be a germline uh, polymorphism upon validation. Uh, and then there are false positives, which are just artifactual um, uh, mutations that, uh, that give the illusion of a mutation, but are actually just not, uh, not variations at all. Um, so, so then once we, we have gone through a validation process, um, then, then the task is really to um, try to assess some sort of clinical relevance or, or functional relevance to, to the mutations that we found. And one way to do that is just by assessing recurrence. So how often is a gene mutated in a, in a larger population? So we can then extend in a, looking at a small number of genes um, that, that uh, have emerged from our validation exercise, we can then do sort of more targeted focused analysis on a larger set of patients to try to uh, infer clinical relevance. And then, ultimately, what we want to try to do is, in a new, new mutation, try to figure out exactly what it's doing biochemically. And that's a much longer process that takes, um, uh, that involves uh, uh, model systems and in vivo experiments to try to understand, um, when you induce the mutation, what actually happens uh, to the biochemistry of those cells. Mm -hmm. So that, in a, in, a, in a very simplified way, is, is usually what mutational discovery experiments are, are uh, involving. Okay, any questions on that? Yes? So 
So if during your validation experiment you find SMPs that are not included in your prediction list? Um, so that, that's kind of challenging. Um, then you'd have to revalidate those in a different way. Um, usually the validation experiments are very targeted. So it's just at, you're asking the question, in my list of predicted events, how many can I reconfirm in the, in the validation experiment? It does happen where you discover something de novo in a validation experiment. Um, but that's, um, I mean, from pure experimental design, it's, um, it's probably not principled to, to, to then pull out that because in, in, it's not comparable to how, how the others were found in the first place. So. Okay. So, so I'm just going to talk about um, some use case uh, examples of, of some published work that I've been involved in um, just to illustrate some of these points. So, um, so I work in both ovarian cancer and breast cancer and um, so when this technology first came about, um, it, it was it was of great interest uh, to to a colleague of mine, uh, David Huntsman, and um, and so we embarked on a on a project to try to look at um, the different subtypes of ovarian cancer. And the reason why uh, this is important is that um, really uh, ovarian cancer is not one disease; it's made up of several different diseases that differ in uh, in many regard. Um, and this this really depicts um, the uh, amino histochemistry uh, exp protein expression of of a, of a panel of markers. Um, and you can see that the different these four different subtypes um, differ quite uh, quite a bit in terms of their their protein expression profiles. Um, and and moreover, the, really um, they're they have distinct epidemiological and genetic risk factors. They have different precursor lesions, different biomarker profiles, and completely different clinical behavior. And um, the, the real issue when we embarked on this is that at that time, and, and really still today, um, the biomarker studies and, and treatment protocols uh, were not subtype specific. So, so we were trying to use a broad brushstroke to, to look at really just very distinct variations of, uh, of a disease and you couldn't even call it really one disease, it's a collection of different diseases. And so we asked the question, do ovarian carcinomas feature subtype specific mutations that can be developed as biomarkers for early diagnosis or, or therapeutic targets? And at this time, um, uh, DNA sequencing or whole genome sequencing uh, was a little bit infeasible to do on a population level, so we actually uh, embarked on a on an experiment to sequence the transcriptomes uh, of a number of cases, and we really uh, we looked at um, uh, these five subtypes here, um, and this high grade serous being the most common. Um, that uh, and then uh, granulosa cell tumors. Um, these are the two that I'll highlight being the most rare, um, and 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 actually phenotypically distinct as well. So um, so the result of this was the discovery of a of a recurrent mutation in a gene called FOXL2. And I'll just to illustrate some of the steps that we went through to actually find this. So we sequenced um, 15 uh, different cases. Um, so four were granulosa cell tumors, another five were uh, clear cell cancers, the ovary, uh, another four endometrioid carcinomas, and then um, uh, a couple of different um, uh, cell lines. And what we found is that um, using that protocol or the, the schematic workflow that I described earlier, we found about um, three, three to five hundred um, non-synonymous variants uh, in each case. And so at this time, this was really the first time we'd encountered any data like this. And, and we were just kind of baffled as what, what do we do with that? It's a lot of events um, in each tumor um, and how are we going to make sense of this? So we decided to, decide to be extremely stringent and, and really focus our energy on, on the original hypothesis, which was looking for subtype and specific and recurrent mutations. So what we, we took the perspective of, of uh, the granulosa cell tumors, and we asked um, how many variants were present in three or more of the granulosa cell tumors. Um, and so that led us to, to just filtering the list down to 29 positions. And then we asked, OK, of those, how many were unique to granulosis cell tumors? So, so how many were subtype specific? 
And that, again, filtered the list down extremely, uh, to an extremely small list of five. Mm -hmm. And then upon inspection, and you'll be doing a little bit of this in the lab, when you, upon inspection, we realized that three of these were actually just artifacts. Um, and so that left us with only two. And um, so then we carried these forward for validation. And uh, one of them did not validate. And what we were left with is the following mutation. So this is a um, uh, position um, uh, in the transcript of a position 402 in a gene called uh, FOXL2. It's a transcription factor. And uh, it induces a uh, cysteine to tryptophan amino acid change, and, uh, which is really kind of a massive uh, amino acid transformation um, in terms of biochemistry. And the remarkable thing is that all four of the granulosa cell tumors had exactly the same point mutation um, in the genome. Um, and this was not found in any other of the tumors we looked at, and nor was it found in any of the polymorphism databases that existed. So we got quite excited about this, and then um, we looked at the matched normal DNA and confirmed that indeed this mutation was somatic as well. Um, so, so once we had that, uh, then we uh, executed the next step, which was to look in a larger cohort of tumors. And so um, uh, David, my colleague, is, he's, he's been quite generous with um, donating samples over the years. Yes? Uh, so what would you have done if you would not have found that mutation in the genome? Well, we've done that if, if, if we hadn't found the mutation in the genome? Mm -hmm. So if it was only there in the transcriptome? Yeah. Well, so we actually have found uh, variants like that, which are transcriptome specific. Um, and, and there's a phenomenon called RNA editing, which is a known, um, a known phenomenon whereby post-transcriptionally the message gets um, modified. And um, there have been uh, a lot of speculation as to what these RNA edits do. Um, some speculation is that um, in certain organisms it's used for immune evasion. So in, in uh, trypanosomes, for example, um, they undergo significant editing of their transcriptomes in order to evade the immune system of the, of the host. Um, in a tumor that uh, we sequenced, and I'll talk about in a, in, in a few minutes, um, we actually determined that um, some of these edits could actually induce um, non-synonymous changes in the, in the protein coding sequence. And, and so it really has a potential to alter function. And so that's actually a, potentially a new class of, of, uh, of variation in cancer that um, we just don't really understand. Um, there have been some studies now emerging Although I think there's some controversy in the literature as some of the recent studies on RNA editing as to how well they were actually executed. But nonetheless, it does seem to be a phenomenon in normal cells as well. Um, and, it, and it potentially is a way to um, regulate uh, uh, expression of proteins by changing 3' prime UTRs, for example, so that MR, uh, microRNAs can't bind there. But that's all um, fairly speculative at this point. Um, anyways, so. Had we not found it in the genome, um, we would have been a bit, have been a bit perplexed, but um, ultimately probably would have called it an RNA, RNA edit and, and would have made a different story altogether. Yeah. So, um, so then moving on, um, we, uh, we collected a, a set of granulosa cell tumors from around the world. This is a pretty rare disease, so we had to call in favors from internationally. And what we found is that of the 89 tumors that we were able to collect, 86 of them had also had the exact same change. Okay, so this is um, probably un almost unprecedented level of recurrence in, a, in the tumor. Um, and so really this then um, we looked at uh, the same position in 800 other cancers um, and never found it again. So it's highly recurrent, highly specific uh, change that essentially defines the disease. And so um, histologically, this disease um, is in a, in a sort of a spectrum uh, whereby a pathologist has to sort of make a call based on their, their intuition. So looking down the microscope, looking at the morphology and says, ah, oh, it kind of looks like this, so I'll, I'll call it a granulosa cell tumor. But now we have a precise uh, molecular test uh, that's based on the genome that defines what this disease is. Okay, so we went from a, a disease that could be difficult to diagnose by histology, and really this finding provides a diagnostic and a, and a novel target uh, uh, for therapeutics. And the, the other point I want to make is that FOXLT was not implicated in cancer at all. 
prior to our study. So it wasn't even on the radar screen. Okay, so this is really where sequencing, um, and I didn't mention this before, but a lot of the genes that we know about so far have really been done by targeted analysis or targeted experiments. So uh, an investigator will have a, a gene of interest and, and maybe sequence just that gene. And, uh, and because of their uh, prior work, it might have a prior assumption that this is a, an important cancer gene and may find mutations. That's a very low throughput um, and somewhat biased way of doing mutation discovery. What the sequencing technology allows us to do is look at the whole genome um, in an unbiased fashion and make discoveries like, like this that uh, we're, we're on a gene that maybe wasn't on the radar screen. Yeah. So in this type of tumor, is this the type of ovarian cancer which is implicated also with the inherited GRCA? Uh, no, this is not. No, this is the, a rare, much rarer subtype. Um, that's a, a sex cord stromal tumor. It's non, non epithelial. Um, so, what you're thinking about are high grade serous cancers. Um, that's BRC, 20% are BRCA1 inherited. Okay. Is the prognosis for this type uh, just as bad as that? It's actually not. Um, but if, if what happens to, to patients with these tumors is that um, there are uh, consistent recurrences and eventually. Um, um, usually patients um, will undergo maybe 15 years of surgeries, um, repeated surgeries to extract the tumor. There's no targeted chemotherapy that will eradicate the, the disease. And eventually, um, to, not to be grim about it, but basically patients will, will usually succumb to having had too many surgeries. Um, okay, so we then focused our attention on uh, a slightly more common but still rare subtype called ovarian, uh, called clear cell carcinomas of the ovary, or endometriosis associated carcinomas, um, whereby uh, endometriotic cysts can then lead to, um, to tumors. And uh, so, so we apply the same type of technique, and, and we found mutations in a gene called uh, ARID1A. And what was quite different about this is that. Um, we found truncating mutations. So these are mutations that induce a premature stop code. Um, did, did we go over that stuff at all? So missense, nonsense mutations? Yes, yeah. Okay, so we did. Um, okay, so, so these, are, these are quite different in nature. Okay, so these are um, truncating mutations that induce a premature stop code on. And what we found is that in contrast to the granulosa cell tumors, we found the exact same position that was recurrent. We found mutations that were spread throughout the gene. Okay, so, and if you think about the consequences of that, so you could think of uh, the granulosa cell tumors as inducing a very specific change, and that, that change is probably having some sort of very, very specific function. Um, and so we can maybe call that a gain of function or a switch of function. Um, in this case, we saw stop codons peppered throughout the gene, and, um, and that's really a loss of function. So, uh, so that's the hypothesis there, is that it doesn't really matter where you induce a stop codon. As long as you do that, those transcripts will get degraded and, and proteins won't get made. And so uh, on the top, we're showing the discovery cohort, um, uh, whereby we, we have 15 tumors in the discovery cohort. And we found that, um, that seven of them harbored a, a, a stop codon mutation or an insertion or deletion in, in this gene. And then when we went to, went to look at um, uh, the extension cohort, um, we found that really uh, the, there were stop codon mutations peppered all throughout um, the protein, and, and it was highly recurrent at about uh, 46% in clear cell carcinomas. Yeah, it was, it was, tra uh, yeah, so, so I, yeah, sure, so I have to admit that um, th this was um, really done by, uh, by scanning spreadsheets, um, and we just noticed, we just noticed it, that, look, there are a lot of stop codon mutations in this gene, let's, let's, let's check it out, so it was a, more of a hunch, um, I wouldn't, claim that there is a real systematic approach to finding this. Um, we were just really browsing the data that we had generated, which was already a very, very filtered down list. Um, so that allowed us to browse it in, in, a, in actually, without looking at 100,000 sites, we could look at um, you know, less than a few hundred sites. And, and that's actually doable in a, in a human, 
you know, with your brain just looking through, um, through, through, through this. So that's how this was found. Um, I wish I could claim that there is a beautiful algorithm and, and that discovered this, but yeah, yeah. But the human brain is sometimes better than computers. Um, <laughs> so sometimes, yeah, yeah. I did say sometimes. Yeah. Okay, so um, so what I uh, th then what we did is actually, um, and this this is uh, David carry this this forward and, and really tr wanted to try to um, uh, look at uh, hundreds of tumors and so we found that the mutation status actually correlated with amino histochemistry um, which is a measurement essentially of protein expression of the gene so when there was a mutation we often saw uh, loss of, uh, of the protein expression and uh, and so we were able to look at many many tumors in this way and, and essentially deem that uh, around 50% um, of these cancers uh, were um, uh, harbored this mutation. And so the other thing about this gene is that it's involved in uh, the chrom chromatin remodeling complex, and uh, which is uh, an important um, complex for, uh, for genome stability. And, and really, the, um, uh, what we found is that um, uh, this was highly recurrent, and that and that and this has now prompted um, the next steps, which was uh, to do now whole genome sequencing of 50 of these uh, carcinomas um, and, and their matched normals. And really, the question there is: um, so so we found mutation in 50 percent of the cases, but what's happening in the other 50 percent? Um, and so now we're, that's underway now, and, and we're engaged in that uh, study now. So to sum up some of the ovarian cancer uh, research. Um, so, so sequencing and, and, and robust analysis has revealed um, really subtype specific mutations. And, and this is what the hypothesis originally was, is that these, these diseases are, are distinct and they probably harbor subtype specific mutations. And by sequencing, we've actually shown this. And so FOXL2 provides a diagnostic tool for, for uh, granulosa cell tumors of the ovary, and ARID1A provides um, a novel tumor suppressor and illuminates the sweet sniff complex as an important biochemical pathway. Um, and so um, the, the other thing about this is that uh, that's really important is that these two studies um, illustrate really two types of mutations that I think we need to be um, cognizant about. One is where you're targeting a very specific um, part of the protein, um, and and where there's a gain of function, and so that's that, uh, usually that's um, very recurrent, even by position or by amino acid position, where a similar substitution is observed um, in many many cases. In contrast, ARID one A um, is a loss of function, whereby you'll see truncating or uh, mutations or indels um, throughout the protein, um, and that usually indicates that it may be a tumor suppressor. And so P53, for example, is, is um, very similar to ARID1A. In fact, it's been shown now um, just through personal communications and um, sequencing a lar very large number of cell lines that ARID1A is likely um, uh, the second most frequently mutated gene um, in cancers. And what's remarkable about this is that this was not on the radar screen before um, sequencing technology came to be. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. So, so this table says that in um, clear cell carcinomas, 46% um, of the cases uh, harbor the mutation. Um, in under other endometriosis associated um, cancers such as uh, endometrioid carcinoma, 30% of the cases harbor the mutation, but in high grade serous, which is the most common subtype, none of them have it. These are all ovarian cancers. They're all ovarian subtypes. cancer subtypes, that's right. Yeah, sorry, I didn't explain that well. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now switching to breast cancer. So uh, around the same time that we're doing all the work in ovarian cancer, I um, was engaged in a project uh, to sequence a, a lobular breast cancer. And um, this was quite um, fortuitous, because at the time we were, uh, we were searching for um, 
uh, when the sequencing technology was just coming online at the, at the Genome Sciences Center in Vancouver, um, uh, we had found this tumor, um, and this is work with Sam Aparicio, uh, led by Sam. And, uh, and so he had uh, identified a, a tumor for which we had um, a, a pleurally fusion um, metastasis um, that had emerged uh, nine years after the original primary tumor. But we had the primary tumor sample in the tumor bank already. And so we were able to ask some pretty unique questions here. And um, first of all, we were able to ask the question, and this has never been done before at this point, is what mutations were actually present in the metastatic tumor? Could we use the genome sequencing technology to fully define the mutational landscape of this tumor? And then we asked how many new mutations um, or aberrations arose over time. So we could compare the profile of the metastatic tumor to its matched primary uh, from the same individual uh, from nine years earlier. And then we asked uh, as well is, is, you know, can this digital uh, allelic abundance counting um, be used to detect heterogeneity in, in, in samples as well? So, so these are the major questions, and I'll just illustrate how we went about trying to address those questions. So um, by today's standards, uh, this was maybe not so staggering, but um, even uh, about three years ago, this was a, an amazing amount of data we generated. Um, we gen generated 3 billion um, paired end reads, um, or 120 gigabases of a line sequence uh, of the genome. And, uh, and also generated uh, about six gigabases of a line sequence of the transcriptome. So we also sequenced the transcriptome of this tumor. And, and the results of this uh, were, again, following a similar workflow. Um, we found about 1,500 novel non-synonymous variants. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we engaged in a pretty, in a comprehensive validation exercise. So we, we took those 1,500 or so, and, and we wanted to uh, actually validate every single position and, and check for its somatic status. So um, we're, this is um, validation with Sanger sequencing. And um, so we were able to uh, Sanger sequence about 1,100 of these. Um, about 450 or so uh, were confirmed. And, um, and 32 uh, were confirmed as somatic. So in this experimental design, which I don't advocate, um, but we couldn't afford to do um, the proper experimental design, um, this experimental design, we only sequenced the tumor. We did not sequence the match normal. We had the DNA, um, but we chose to um, do look at the normal DNA in a targeted way rather than a comprehensive way. So um, at, that, at that time, that was the most cost-effective way. Things have changed to a point now where that's no longer the most cost-effective way. It's much more cost-effective to, to the sequence matched pairs. Um, and, and then that way, so you can see from 400 or so confirmed variants, only 32 of them were somatic. Okay. So that would have likely removed quite a few um, of those germline variants. So after um, looking at these uh, 32 somatic uh, changes, um, then we asked these questions and compared them to the primary DNA. And what was really remarkable uh, about this is that only five of these mutations uh, were prevalent in the in the primary, were, were present in the primary tumor at high allelic abundances. Okay, so this is these are mutations from the metastatic tumor. Uh, only five were present in the primary. At, uh, at high abundance, um, where the majority of cells harbor the mutation. Interestingly, six of these were present at very low frequencies. Um, so they were detectable in the primary, but at low frequencies. And this, this is significant because it suggests that um, only a portion of the cells at the time of, of diagnosis in the primary tumor harbor these mutations. And so that was uh, very good evidence of uh, mutational heterogeneity at the time of diagnosis, diagnosis. So the primary tumor was already heterogeneous and made up of different clonal populations. Um, and, and so that, that has um, significant implications for, um, for how to study these tumors in the first place. I think we've talked about um, intratumoral heterogeneity a lot now. And then uh, remarkably, 19 of these mutations were just not there in the primary tumor at all. So there had been significant mutational evolution uh, over the course of the life history of, these, of this tumor. So this was one of the sobering results of this, is that um, so we took these 32 mutations, or, or uh, a subset of them, 
and we looked at um, that same position in, in 192 other cancers. And the only recurrent um, positions, uh, or re recurrent variants that we found were um, in three cases. We found uh, nearby mutations in, in ERB2. We talked about ERB2. Uh, and we found some truncating mutations in a gene called uh, HAL3, but only in two cases. And the rest of them um, were not seen again. So that suggests that within breast cancer, uh, uh, mutational profiles are extremely, extremely heterogeneous. Um, so, so within in individual tumors, there's heterogeneity. Between patients, there's heter heterogeneity as well. So, uh, at, at the mutational level, okay. Um, so, what's also uh, was was notable about this is that most of the genes had never been, again, once again, never been seen before in in any cancer. Uh, and certainly not breast cancers. So, uh, so again, it illustrates the power of, of this unbiased whole genome sequencing approach um, to reveal new uh, potential cancer genes. Okay, so uh, I think I'm going to skip ahead at this point. Um, so would you consider those mutations to be drivers in that patient? Well, so, so we think we know what the driver uh, mutation is in that one because uh, we found a mutation in the gene called PALB2, and um, that's one of the genes that was present in the primary tumor, um, and that is that. I mean, that is a very nice way to um, try to get at um, driver mutations is by doing this sort of matched analysis, whereby the early events um, should be present. Uh, so, so, so if you look at the metastasis. And then you ask the question, well, which mutations were present in the, in the primary tumor? Um, and uh, those necessarily, um, the driver events are probably present in the primary tumor. So it drastically reduces the candidate um, drivers of tumor genesis. So we go from 32 mutations down to five candidates. And one of those candidates is a gene called PALB2, which is partner, partner and localizer of BRCA2. And so it's, um, that's likely what we think is, is going on there. Do you, when you're doing that kind of study, look at the germline ones at all, or do you just, I mean, because potentially that person could have something that predisposes him or her to all those other mutations? Yeah, so, so in, in this study, very difficult because it's an n of weak equals one uh, experiment. So, um, so it's hard to ascribe any kind of susceptibility to, uh, to one patient. Um, but what will likely emerge, and I've seen this. Um, uh, in, in various uh, circles is that um, there are now uh, large-scale efforts uh, underway to sequence families with hereditary breast cancer but without BRCA1 or BRCA2, without the known markers um, for hereditary breast cancer, which um, uh, approximately 50% of hereditary breast cancer is unexplained. And so there are huge efforts underway now to do things like studying 1,000 different um, patients um, and patient families and sequencing their whole genomes um, to try to find, uh, in an epidemiological way, the, the susceptibility risk factors. Um, yes? So how do you know that uh, the metastatic is not its own primary? Yeah, that's a great question. We don't. Yeah. Suggest that it's related because the mutations are the same, but. Um, we found we didn't find zero overlap. We found five mutations that overlap. So, yeah. so can you quantify when you do this type of pair analysis um, how many cells in the primary? Yeah. Cell? Okay. So let's let's. I was gonna uh, get a bit slow here. So I thought I'd uh, gloss over this, but since you asked the question, we'll do that. So um, so I'll go back to this then. Um, so what we did is um, th this is this is where. Uh, this technology, I think, can, can really shine. And so what we did is in a very targeted way. So we designed amplicons um, by, by PCRing um, uh, just the mutations of interest. So we, we, we designed um, uh, primers around our 32 somatic mutations and amplified that DNA up. Then we pooled it all together and then, um, and then sequenced it on, a, on the lane of Illumina. And so you can imagine that um, uh, with the throughput of this technology, um, uh, this produced an incredible amount of redundancy, so almost uh, 10,000 fold in some cases, um, whereby we could uh, look at how many reads or what proportion of reads that align to the um, position of interest um, contained uh, the mutation. And so 
Um, so we can use some statistics to answer whether the mutation was there or not. But more importantly, um, we can look at the actual frequencies um, of, of the mutation. So, so here um, I'm showing uh, the, uh, the depth of the primary. So this is the, the sequence, uh, the number of reads we were able to obtain at that position uh, in the primary tumor. And then the proportion of those reads that harbor the mutation. Okay, so here you have 50% uh, um, down to about 25%, and we deem these as being um, what we call dominant mutations. So these are present in the majority of cells, um, and and then in the in the metastatic, uh, you can see uh, uh, how what proportion of, of cells harbor the mutation as well. And so these were somewhat comparable. Okay, so then we move to the next class, which is where we have um, somewhat dominant mutations in, in the metastatic. Um, so ranging from about 28% uh, to, to upwards of 60%. Um, and, and, and really these were present in the primary tumor, but at much lower frequencies. Okay, so you can see that here, uh, only 13% of the alleles that we sequenced actually harbor the mutation and, and almost down to, to sub 1%. So, so this is the, the precision that we can get. Um, we can look at mutations in a deep sequencing and targeted fashion uh, whereby you're getting um, multiple tens of thousands of reads aligning to a particular position, um, we can start to, to uh, get at even sub 1% um, pr presence of alleles. Wouldn't you say that those are the most important driving ones to be for the, the metastatic because they were low frequency in the primary, they were upregulated in the metastatic? Yeah. It, absolutely. So that's the other side of the question is, is, is you know, what's driving the metastasis? Um, and, and that's, uh, these are obviously been selected for over time because they're present in a small number of cells and then, then, they, um, then they were selected for in, in, to become uh, uh, dominant mutations in the primary. So you're saying that healthy two was the most important one for the primary? Yeah, it, it, because it was already present in high abundance in the primary, um, and, and it's because of its function, we know what it does, um, uh, that, that's our hypothesis for, for this particular tumor. Yeah. So my question looking at this data is that, do you know in the primary if all these mutations are actually present in the same cell, or is the met metastatic still composed of multiple cells that launch from the primary tumor? Because yeah. otherwise you would expect the frequency to be the same yeah, that's right. So, so there is some variation in the frequency in the in the metastatic tumor as well, um, and that's almost certainly the case that it's not uniform. Uh, it's probably heterogeneous as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, so finally, then then there's the last group here, which is um, um, this list of uh, uh, of mutations that were basically. These levels were not above the, detect, uh, the detection of just statistical noise, and so uh, or the background error rate, and so um, so these these were basically deemed as not present at all. Okay. All right. The no denominator is uh, is the depth here. So um, so basically, what this is is a number of um, variant alleles over this. This column here, which is the number of total reads aligning to the position. Okay, so you can see. Let me just go back. Basically, it's like this. So, in this particular example, you would have. Um, so the depth would be um, the total number of reads here, and um, and the ratio would be this number of, of variants. So in this case, uh, the A's, which is looks like about 80%, um, eighty percent, eighty or eighty or ninety percent um, uh, over the the total number of reads. Okay. Okay. So, um, then just to summarize, so um, in this project, there were 32 novel somatic mutations revealed in this metastatic tumor. Um, approximately 28 of the genes uh, were not known to be mutated in cancer uh, before we embarked on this. Comparison with the primary tumor revealed significant mutational evolution and in intratumoral heterogeneity. Um, I didn't get into this, but um, comparison to the transcriptome of the genome revealed uh, that there was widespread RNA editing, so to get back to Francis's question. So we found a lot of variants and confirmed them that were present only in the transcriptome and not in the genome. And this suggests that um, it just raises a lot of questions. What are these edits doing? Um, are they specific to cancer? We don't know. Um, do they have any kind of function in cancer? We don't know. Um, this, uh, it's something that we're following up. 
and uh, engaged in heavily at this point. So the, uh, it's not the same type of numbers that were reported in these uh, recent signed papers frequently? Actually, uh, they are the same type of numbers, yeah. Yeah. We've only we've reported the, we looked at the, um, the non synonymous changes um, in a targeted way, but there are many, many edits and UTRs. Um, that uh, that are detected in, in clear, very clear signals. Um, so, what I what I want to emphasize as well, and we'll discuss some of the details of this, is is that um, you know, although I didn't stress it, and this is more of a biology uh, focused part of the lecture, um, bioinformatics is the discovery engine in these cancer genome sequencing projects. That's how the discoveries are made. They're made in the computer. Okay, and, uh, and we validate in the lab, uh, but the discoveries, initial discoveries, and initial insights are made through computational analysis. And so I think uh, what's also becoming very clear in this field is that if you're going to study cancer genomes, you're all here for a cancer genomics workshop, if you're going to can study cancer genomes, um, you have to know about sequencing. And to uh, understand sequencing, you have to be adept computationally. It's the only way to do it. That is the microscope of today for cancer genomics, is, is, is the computers in front of you, or the computers you're about to see uh, in the tour at the OICR, which are much bigger machines, I guess. Um, but, but nonetheless, um, this is the way it's done, and this is the way it's going to be. So, um, so if you're going to be in this field, uh, uh, becoming adept computationally, or at least partnering with people that are computationally adept, is a is a requirement. Okay. Um, so then, just to follow up, um, so currently what we're doing in the breast cancer space is sequencing a uh, uh, hundred tumor normal pairs of triple negative breast cancer. Uh, it's the most aggressive form of breast cancer, um, and uh, occurs in about fifteen percent of the population of breast cancers. Um, we have a submitted manuscript under review. For that. Okay, so um, what's our schedule? We're we going to 10:30 before we break, or? Okay. Okay. Good. Okay, so is everyone ready for some statistics now? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So. Now that we've sort of discussed uh, the motivation and, and some of the success stories behind um, sequencing, uh, so let's get into some of the, the nitty gritties of uh, how to actually uh, analyze these, these, these genomes. So I mentioned this yesterday, but um, I'll mention it again, that cancer genomes have specific properties that warrant specialized analytical strategies. Okay, so the first property is this tumor normal admixture problem. Um, so tumor DNA is often contaminated with DNA from non-malignant cells, and this, again, may dilute important biological signals. Um, intratumoral heterogeneity, we've just seen that um, cancer is often a mosaic of cellular populations that are genomically distinct. This must be considered. Um, as you saw yesterday, uh, many tumors uh, undergo uh, genomic instability, so there are a large number of copy number changes, loss of heterozygosity, and genomic rearrangements, um, all of which you looked at yesterday, um, that will distort the expected allelic distributions. And then finally, um, the experimental design to capture somatically acquired mutations is quite different um, than, um, than most epidemiological studies that are studying um, potentially normal, ge normal genomes or, or um, looking for a Mendelian inheritance um, type of diseases. And um, the data generate are generated from a pair of DNA samples for the same patient, usually a tumor sample and a normal sample. In some cases now, many groups are now looking at multiple samples uh, from uh, the same individual, same tumor, um, or looking at time series, and Ro Robert's engaged in a project like that, in fact. Um, and so looking at how uh, genomes evolve. So the experimental designs are very, very different and, and, and be, can be quite, and really the statistics, statistical tests and, and the anal, analysis that goes into, uh, into looking at those questions needs to take that into account. Okay. 
So when you undergo a sequencing experiment, you get data back, and it looks something like this. Um, it's just a bunch of sequences, and you have no idea where they come from. Well, it doesn't quite look like this. It's a little bit more organized than a nice flat file, and usually a text file of some kind. Um, but, but for all intents and purposes, it's like this. You don't know where these reads come from. So thankfully, we have the reference human genome, uh, which is generated by the Human Genome Project. Uh, and essentially, the first task is to take this um, set of reads and align them. And so we get something like that. And um, so now uh, we have a much uh, more organized and ordered uh, uh, representation of the data, whereby we have some idea, mostly, uh, uh, of where these reads originated from in the genome. Okay. So um, what I've done here is a colored, uh, once we have alignments, actually I should talk about alignment first. Um, so, so how do we do this? It's essentially like a giant jigsaw puzzle. And, um, and what you're trying to do is assemble all these reads um, based on, on a scaffold that's provided by the reference sequence. And there are a whole host of tools um, that have been developed. Um, uh, one of the earlier, I would say, robust methods was MAC. Um, its, its next iteration is BWA, um, but there are other tools um, like Shrimp and Mosaic um, that uh, uh, have different properties and um, and shrimp was developed in, uh, in my Brudno's lab here in Toronto. So, so there are a number of tools um, that are available for alignment, and they all are essentially have uh, something in common, where they, they chop, chop up the genome and, and induce um, string matching uh, with some sort of mismatch tolerance so that um, single nucleotide variants can be captured. And um, so, so what we can do once we have alignments is we can actually look at um, uh, where we have variations in, uh, in the genome compared to the reference. And that's where these red nucleotides here are, are uh, highlighted. So, so if we look at that, um, what we can do is we can take that, what I, I would say, a matrix of sequences. And, um, and then what we can do is we can compress that down into uh, what I'm going to call allelic counts. So I mentioned that this is digital um, uh, sequencing, whereby we can actually count the number of alleles. And, and what we want to try to do is to find these positions in the, in the genome, uh, whereby there are variations um, compared to the reference. And so if we compress that down into two vectors, whereby the top uh, vector here represents the number of reads that match the reference, and the bottom vector is the number of reads that uh, have a mismatch, um, then, then we get something like this, or we get a representation like this, okay? And so we want to be able to ask the question in, a, in really three billion positions. Um, so you can look at this, um, it's just a fixed number of positions, and you can look at it and say, okay, I know where the variants are, no problem, right? You can visualize that. But you're not going to be able to do that for the whole genome. So you need a principled way to, uh, to ask the question, okay, given all my alignments and my allelic counts, uh, how can I find variations? So we uh, embarked on a, a project whereby we wanted to model these alleles. And uh, so I'll use a little bit of mathematical notation now, uh, whereby uh, we let A sub I um, be the number of reference reads at a position I. And I'm going to build up on the right, I'll build up what's called a probabilistic graphical model. And you don't need to really know all the, nitty the details about that, except that it's a nice way of representa representing a statistical model. And so, um, so we have um, two, per two variables that we can represent. And, N sub i is then actually the total number of reads at uh, the given position. And these are shaded uh, quantities. And um, that's why, and that's because they're known, they're observed. These are things that we um, observe. Now we have some unobserved things that we want to actually ask about. We want to ask, um, in now, in very similar representation uh, to, to the genotyping that we looked at yesterday, um, but instead of major and minor allele, we have reference, non-reference allele. Okay, so I'm going to use um, lowercase a and b uh, to represent that. So it's very similar in nature. It's just that um, it's no, it's not major, minor. It's reference, not reference. 
Okay, so we have three possible genotypes. Let's assume a diploid state. So we talked about non-diploid states, and we'll get into that with sequencing as well. But for the time being, let's assume a diploid state. And we can ask the question at each position, which one of three possible genotypes is most likely to have given rise to that data? Okay, and that's what we're trying to infer here. That's the major question. Um, what's, what we can do is actually in de then, um, in a probabilistic way, we can induce what we call a prior and we, uh, over top of this um, set of genotypes. And we can say, well, most of the positions we know are going to be actually um, homozygous for the reference. So most of the positions in the genome will actually be AA. Does that, does that make sense? Because the, the humans are mostly the same, <laughs> and, uh, and tumors are mostly the same to their normal DNA. Um, and then, uh, but then we can set um, um, the, the rest of the probabilities on the other two um, uh, accordingly, okay? Uh, and then we have uh, a parameter. And this parameter, mu sub k, uh, represents um, the, what we call the genotype-specific parameter of, of a binomial distribution. So binomial distributions are great for modeling things like coin flips, where you have two possible outcomes, okay? So you can imagine that um, there might be um, three different coins that we're trying to uh, model here. We're trying to guess the bias of each of these coins. And so you might have a coin that um, mostly comes up heads, okay? And that will be, um, with, these, with some exceptions, um, it will be a coin that represents the AA genotype, okay? So it's going to come up mostly reference. And then you're going to have a coin that um, is, let's say, balanced, 50-50. And, and that's going to represent what? What would that represent? The AB, a heterozygous position, right? We have half and half. And then you have another coin that represents um, the, the variant alleles, homozygous um, for the variant. And that'll be highly biased towards the, the, the variant alleles. Okay, so and that's, and those precise quantities are what we're going to try to infer as well. So, so this is uns an unshaded quantity, and, and we're going to try to infer that. So, um, so this is published, uh, this is a tool called SNB Mix. And it's published in uh, Bioinformatics in 2010. Uh, and really what we showed in this paper is that, um, especially in the cancer context, it's very important to, um, to estimate these parameters from data because there'll be skew um, that we saw due to tumor normal head mixture, um, due to intertumoral inter heterogeneity, whereby if you estimate the parameters from the data, you get much more accurate results. There are other tools, such as the one you're going to use today, called GATK, which um, is really designed for normal um, human genomes that, that um, use fixed parameters based on um, estimated uh, uh, parameters. So, so really, they fix, for example, the, the AB coin at 0.5. Uh, but what we, what we know from, from cancer studies is that uh, somatic mutation um, will likely occur in a proportion of cells, and so maybe the most you'd ever get is something like 0.4. Um, and so that makes a big difference in, in the inference of these, um, these positions, okay? All right. So that was uh, how we model alleles for a single sample. However, as I mentioned, um, the most of the experimental design in tumors uh, induces a tumor normal pair design. And ultimately, what we want to do is identify what we call joint genotypes of samples based on um, paired analysis. And some use cases are, for example, tumor normal pairs, um, and, uh, or primary metastatic, or DNA, RNA. Um, there are many different configurations of a paired type of analysis. And um, really, the goal in a tumor normal setting is to, again, separate germline variants uh, which would be present in both the tumor and the normal, from somatic mutations, which are tumor-specific signals. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, and so this is, if you just plot um, probabilities, um, th this is sort of what we hope to see, is that um, here what we have is an increasing number of uh, reference reads um, for the uh, normal on the left and the tumor on the right. And it's just a heat map encoding where the red indicates high, high values and the blue indicates low values, and then there's a spectrum in between. And so you'd expect when you have uh, most of the reads that are referenced in the tumor and the normal, um, that would induce a, a wild type genotype. So that's just, there's no change there at all. Okay. Um, now, where you have uh, mostly norm, 
reference reads in the normal, but then you have variation in the tumor um, across here, okay, then uh, that would be evidence of a somatic mutation. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, this part's important. Um, okay. Um, and then uh, I'll just go over here for a second. So this is um, part of the landscape that would uh, be representative of loss of heterozygosity. So um, here you have heterozygous um, positions in the normal, um, or heter uh, and then um, but you have relatively homozygous positions. So either reference or non-reference, sorry, reference or non-reference over here uh, in the tumor. And so this part of the landscape will uh, it be indicative of loss of heterozygosity in a very similar way than what we described to what we described yesterday. Um, and then finally, you'll notice that most of this landscape is actually dominated by germline. And, and this is important because um, often in these sequencing technologies, you may have, for example, very weak signals in, in, in one, or the other, um, uh, one or the other sample. And this is especially a problem in, when, when the signal is very weak in the normal. So if you were to induce some sort of thresholding and say, okay, I'm going to analyze the normal, I'm going to analyze the tumor. Uh, and in the normal, you have just a very weak signal of a variant, and so you threshold it out, and you don't you, you don't count it. Uh, but then in the tumor, you have a, a, a nice signal of a variant. It'll induce the illusion of a somatic mutation because you, you'll have called uh, uh, the variant in the tumor, but not in the normal. Uh, and so this type, uh, the analysis that that I'm about to describe, um, uh, tries to get past this by um, by doing what we call simultaneous or joint inference, um, and it should be more sensitive to shared signals because they can borrow statistical strength. And you don't need to know the um, the, the underlying uh, mathematical mathematical model, but, but essentially this is what it looks like. So it's an extension of of, of the original SNB mix, uh, whereby uh, the genotype is now a joint genotype. So we have um, the, the, we actually have nine possible genotypes because you have three in the normal and three in the tumor. And we just take the cross product of that. Okay, so we have AAAA, AAAB, AABB, et cetera. Okay, um, and, and the, the variants of interest, of course, are the AAAB and AABB variety. So we're the AA in the normal and your variant in the tumor. Um, so that's really what we're after. Um, and, and really, this um, what we've shown uh, in this work is that um, uh, just look at the right figure here um, in the interest of time. Um, this joint SNB mix model uh, in red, um, when we look at the, um, the top number of candidates of somatic mutations in, uh, in a number of different tumors, um, what we find is that uh, the proportion of those variants that are in polymorphism databases is much lower than if we do, for example, independent analysis. And that suggests to us that we're actually much better able to trap germline alleles um, that would be present in polymorphism databases um, than if we were to just, just do independent analysis in the first place. So, so this is an example of this very specialized um, cancer-focused uh, analysis um, that uh, uh, you know only arises in this type of cancer setting, and 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 where there are clear advantages to try to take advantage of the experimental design um, uh, that we're that we're working with, and so um, so uh, you know it's just a, by way of illustration of how one can actually do a lot better when um, trying to develop specialized analytical strategies for the cancer setting. Okay. So here's another specialized analysis in the cancer setting. Um, so we saw yesterday how copy number changes can influence allelic distributions. And you're familiar now with uh, these types of plots. So this is from um, uh, the same uh, breast cancer that I was talking about earlier. Um, and here you see the normal, uh, this is chromosome 19, and here you see the normal copy number um, uh, from the array. Uh, we did an array on this as well. And then you see the B allele fraction plots on the bottom. You can see that it's nice and uh, heterozygous uh, throughout uh, the, the chromosome. And with uh, then looking at the tumor DNA, uh, you can see that there's a distinct um, allele specific copy number change here that's really skewing the proportion away from uh, heterozygosity. This is the same data um, acquired from the sequence data. 
So we can infer a copy number from the sequence data. I touched on that yesterday. Um, and then when looking at the allelic um, counts from the digital um, uh, processing that I that I mentioned just just before, you can see that a very same phenomenon exists, although it's um, arguably much clearer uh, in the sequencing data than it is in the in the array. Okay, so how can we take advantage of this? Um, well, uh, basically we borrowed the same type of ideas from uh, from the from the array work, whereby copy number changes will induce additional genotypes. So we extended SNB mix then go from the diploid state to, um, to the multiple copy number state. Um, and then by doing that, what we found is that we found these somatic mutations um, that we were not able to find in the original analysis. Um, and so, uh, so made the algorithm much more sensitive um, without losing specificity um, by considering copy number changes. Okay, so, so this is the same, very same idea. Um, and uh, without dwelling on, on the details, but basically an amplification um, induces uh, an additional set of genotypes, and then we can model, um, instead of having three coins that we had before, we now have um, five or six as a case may be, um, depending on the copy number change. And, and the, the, the mutations that we found were all of, of, of this variety here, where we had um, AAAB, for example, where um, the mutation was happening on a very uh, small proportion of, uh, of the alleles, and uh, there was, it was un basically undetectable um, by the other methods, and, um, and, we, and but how, by extending the, the method, we were able to find them. So, um, again, not to dwell, um, but basically we found 24 uh, additional somatic mutations upon reanalysis of the same genomes. This is the genome that we had those 32 somatic mutations in the breast cancer. And by extending the uh, analysis to account for copy number changes, we actually found an additional 24. So we almost doubled the number of mutations. Um, and this is a, a similar table um, to what I showed earlier. So we did deep, deep sequencing to validate these. Uh, and indeed, um, these were in proportions that were um, you know, quite, quite a bit lower. Than, um, than what we observed for the other mutations. Um, and, uh, uh, and you can see in the normal, basically, um, most of these are just not present at all. Um, uh, and so, uh, so these were deemed somatic. Okay. All right, so in terms of uh, statistics, um, we use binomial mixture models uh, fit to the data uh, in, a, in a robust probabilistic framework for modeling allelic counts. Um, and these probabilistic graphical models, as I showed, um, are quite extensible and flexible. And so um, there's a real advantage to just sort of doing from first principles try, trying to develop these uh, analytical models because they can just be uh, extended quite easily. Um, and what I've shown is that joint inference of tumor normal paradata results in increased specificity when predicting uh, somatic mutations. And then finally, that copy number changes can influence allelic distribution. And we can take advantage of that to increase sensitivity to mutations. So um, I'm seeing a lot of tired looks. So I think at this point, um, we're going to take a little break. And, um, and we'll come back. Oh is, it, oh, is it early? OK. Well, we can soldier on then. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. The wall's about to So just while he's looking at that, I mean, really, uh, we're okay. okay, yeah. So, so I'll just uh, one last comment before we take a break is that, so, again, um, this data that is produced by these machines um, is difficult to handle, and um, and uh, both innovation in both uh, in both mathematical and statistical models, as well as software tools and application of software tools, is what is going to discover uh, the mutations. That's what it is, it's computation. Um, so, so there's no other way to look at this data. So don't be under any illusions that you can um, sequence three billion base pairs and then browse it um, while you're sitting in your living room. It's not gonna happen. Um, so so the, the way to look at this is computationally. Um, the field is immature to a point where there aren't really um, great 
GUI tools where you can sit um, and do point and click analysis at this point. And in fact, um, it's kind of, they're coming, uh, but uh, and there are some services that um, there's some companies that have now emerged where you can um, just deposit your data and they'll analyze it for you on the cloud, for example. Um, but uh, that way you're somewhat detached from your data and you're depending on someone else to do some analysis and, and you don't always know what they did. And it's your science, so you should know what's going on um, uh, at, at every level. And so um, it, it's going to be difficult, but uh, you're all at least you're here, so you're always obviously all expressing an interest in trying to learn um, analysis, and and so I think that um, uh, that is what this science is becoming. It's becoming a quantitative science, and and learning how to do analysis is critical to it. So with that, we'll take a break. Okay, so uh, continuing on where we left off. Okay. So I now want to move um, beyond allelic counts because allelic counts uh, only tell part of the story. And um, a very important part of analysis of sequence data is to sort of look at uh, technical artifacts. And um, technical artifacts induce uh, many false predictions. Here's an example. So this is an IGV plot of uh, a tumor on top and a normal on the bottom and it looks suspiciously like a somatic mutation. You've got variants in the tumor and you have no variants in the normal. Um, however, this turned out to be false due to these reads being misaligned uh, to this location. So, uh, so, so uh, this is a, an artifact that we need to watch out for. Insertions and deletions. Um, so here's uh, a region um, where there's an insertion um, in, uh, sorry, rather a deletion in the in the actual reads or in the in the sample itself. Um, likely a somatic deletion, although we see some evidence of it in the in the normal down here. And what this is doing is um, not allowing the reads to align properly. Um, and uh, again, creating the illusion of uh, uh, of variants um, that are really just due to uh, the aligner not being able to cope properly with the presence of, a, of the deletion. So this is a phenomenon that happens quite a bit. Um, the, the GTK tool toolbox that uh, you're going to use in the lab has a way to compensate for this um, <coughs> by doing local realignment around, around indels. It helps a little bit, uh, definitely. So here's an example uh, you can't see it very well, but um, the in the tumor um, we have uh, the presence of, of of some reads, and if we use uh, base quality thresholding, so um, I should mention that um, while the data is digital in, in the sense that we can do allelic counting, in fact. Um, the data that comes off the machine or the nucleotides that are read or the bases that are called have, a, have an associated probability with them. So it's not just it is this base, it's, it's this base with a certain probability. Um, and those probabilities are called base qualities. And so sometimes what we do is threshold, uh, we try to threshold away the low, the low quality bases. Um, and in this particular case, um, there are variants, um, variant uh, bases that are just above the threshold that we used. And, uh, and so again, um, these are still poor quality, but they are above our threshold, and so they get counted. And so um, they're most likely sequencing artifacts um, and, uh, and cannot be really trusted. Um, and, but these sort of leak through, and, and we, call these, we call these as a variant, um, but they turned out to be false. This is one that's quite important. Um, it's called the strand bias problem, and it's induced by, um, by a PCR artifact. Um, I actually don't fully understand how it happens. Maybe, John, do you know how it happens in the, the, the PCR, the strand bias um, PCR artifact? No. Yeah, OK. So, so what, what, it, but what ends up happening is that um, often we get uh, uh, a read um, that gets duplicated many times, or a fragment that gets duplicated many times. And, and it may contain a sequencing error as well. And so um, 
it creates the illusion of a variant, but it can be caught because all the um, variant reads are in the same orientation. Okay, and so that's called a strand bias effect. We can look at we'll look at that in the lab as well. Um, so that's another artifact to to look at. So here's one. Um, this one actually has the plots reversed. Sorry. So the bottom is the tumor, and the uh, the top one is normal. So this one looks beautiful. It's very clean. Um, there's no evidence of base quality problems, alignment problems, indels, um, no strand bias, um, but it's not real. <laughs> so I don't even know what's going on with this one. Um, so the point I'm trying to uh, stress here is that um, allelic counts are, are nice because they, they can model the uh, allelic abundance in the sample. However, um, it's con all, all those counts are confounded by many, many different technical artifacts that are induced, <coughs> induced by the machines, they're induced by alignment, they're induced by properties of the genome as well. Um, and in, in fact, there are certain parts of the genome where it's just very difficult to call variants simply because they're highly repetitive and, and it's hard to align reads there. Um, and Mark was talking, we were talking the other day um, about uh, he's seeing some, some errors in exome capture platforms um, that are uh, um, whereby uh, a lot of miscalled variants are just in certain parts of the probe um, or the tail end of the probe. Um, where you get mishybridization of um, fragments to the to the probe that's trying to pull down this capture experiment. So, so um, if hopefully I've convinced you by this point that it's not um, you will not undergo DNA extraction from tumor, DNA extraction from normal, and get a nice list of somatic mutations. It's not simple. It's a very complex problem that um, there's been a lot of effort into. And, and anecdotally, I can tell you that um, leaders of the TCGA analysis, um, uh, in conversations with them, um, this is uh, the, the American big consortium. Um, so they asked uh, several groups from Baylor, from the Broad, from WashU, from Berkeley um, to take a set of data and call somatic mutations. Same set of data. Use your, their preferred method to call somatic mutations. And then they came back at a subsequent meeting and they compared the results. And the overlaps were really quite tiny. <laughs> so, so that's kind of um, disconcerting and troubling. And, uh, 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 but it's, it gives, you, gives people like me strong motivation to try to improve uh, methods for, for calling these somatic mutations. So it's a non-trivial exercise. And it's still, I would say, in its infancy. But however, um, it, it, that doesn't mean that um, uh, we shouldn't be uh, undaunted by that. We, we should just keep soldiering on. Because obviously there are discoveries to be made, and we're making discoveries as we go. It's just that um, it's difficult to do this in a very systematic way. And this is why validation is extremely important still at this point. OK, so here's some examples of uh, true positives. These are real. Um, Real examples, and and again, sorry. Now I've switched to back again, so the tumor is on the top and the normals on the bottom. Um, so, so in this case, we have um, a very small proportion of reads that contain a variant, um, and, uh, and not, none in the normal. Um, so, so maybe you could somebody can elaborate or just guess to see what's what's going on here. Why do we have? Um, what, what could you speculate as to what's what's happening with this variant? So look at the number of reads there, and then look at the number of reads that contain a variant. So this has been a running theme throughout the whole thing. We've talked about it from day one. What's going on? I've mentioned it about five times. <laughs> Maybe six. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so low frequency. So, so this is probably representative of a mutation that's only present in a small population of cells, a so small proportion of cells. Okay, so, um, and, and these are actually quite hard to detect. So you can imagine that in, there might be 25 reads here, or 50 reads, let's call it 50 reads, and only three of them represent the mutation. Um, and that's barely above the level of, of of noise in the machine as well, and so you can look at the that that signal in the context of some of the other artifacts we're looking at, and really have to try to pull out this signal from all the other noisy things that we've we've looked at. So that, that's quite challenging. 
Um, so here's one uh, that's very similar. Um, here you just have two reads that have a variant. Okay. Um, and these are real. We've validated these and uh, we've deep sequenced them. Okay. So, um, so given all these problems, uh, what's a solution? What are these solutions? Um, so how do we go beyond allelic counts? Well, there are a couple of nice uh, software tools that really um, uh, have been developed for uh, analysis of a thousand genomes data, um, and not. I should really stress uh, with, a, with a caveat that both these tools I'm about to describe have not been um, focused on cancer studies at all. Um, however, um, they are quite effective um, and robust in, in their, uh, and they have huge user communities. And so, um, there's some and, and a lot of engineers behind them to to make them nice, robust software tools. So, um, so the first is SAM tools, um, and they have given some um, URLs for for where to learn more about SAM tools. And it's essentially, it's a suite of tools uh, for working with alignment files, um, and in the so-called community standard um, SAM or BAM format. Uh, and um, and so it allows you to very um, in a in a nice way in a Unix environment manipulate these these alignment huge alignment files uh, in a very efficient way. Um, and so they're fast and memory efficient and um, highly. Um, I use we use SAM tools in our lab um, on a multiple daily basis. The other tool that um, is quite uh, complementary um, but has a lot of the same features um, is the GATK or the Gene or, or GATK or GATK as people call it now. Um, uh, and there's a nice paper that describes um, uh, GATK. It works with the cloud if you want to work on the cloud, um, and it's implemented in Java. And this is actually what we're going to use in the lab. <laughs> So the other thing I wanted to just introduce is um, uh, this format called the VCF, or Variant Calling Format. Um, and this is, uh, again, a community standard, but will likely, I think, become uh, a really de facto standard for, for variant calling, simply because of the communities that are developing it, uh, being the Broad, um, and they're really involved in a huge number of projects, and so um, are really driving the development of this format, um, along with uh, the Thousand Genomes people. So, uh, in the lab, I would really encourage you to um, to, to follow this uh, this URL here, um, understanding the uh, Unified Genotypers VCF format. Um, I'm not, there's it's really complex. Um, there's quite a lot of information there, um, and but it, and it's something that would require sort of independent study. I'm not going to go through every single field, um, but but at least it point you to the resource, and and you can then look at that and and. Uh, uh, and learn about it yourself. And we'll explore this VCF format in the lab. The really strength the strength of this is that it computes many features about the data, uh, which can be re used to remove poor quality um, poor quality features. Okay, so uh, poor quality um, predictions. So this really moves beyond the allelic counts um, and gives you all the contextual information about base quality and mapping quality and strand bias and um, presence of indels and all those things that I touched upon with my examples um, are computed uh, in this VCF um, uh, format and, and computed by the, the GATK uh, tools. So given that, uh, we um, tried to take advantage of that and see what we could learn from um, some of our, our data that we've uh, engaged in, in in this field. So, um, so I mentioned that we've been sequencing these triple negative breast cancers, and um, we actually uh, really took the approach of being very liberal with our variant calling and our somatic mutation calling. And so we actually tried to validate um, 3,000 positions in these um, 50 tumor normal um, pair of breast cancer exomes. And the results of that were basically that we were able to revalidate about 1,000. And um, the remaining 2,000 were either wild type, so we never saw the variant again, or their germline, in which case they were just um, missed in the, in the normal and the original exome data. So we have um, uh, 2,000 um, what we call false positives or, or negatives. So 1,000 positives and 2,000 negatives. And so being a com computer scientist that with experience in machine learning, I thought it might be nice to see what we can learn from um, this data computationally and extract all the features that we can um, from using SAM tools and GTK um, and then learn a classifier that can um, 
using machine learning techniques, distinguish between these true positives and, and false positives. So, so we embarked on this. And this is uh, my PhD student, Jari Ding, who's uh, been leading this. And, um, and, and really, the results are quite beautiful. Um, so here shows a, a principal component analysis that beautifully separates um, when we look at features. So now, not just looking at illegal accounts, but looking at all these features that are computed by JTK and SAM tools, we can beautifully separate the somatic mutations from, from the non-somatic mutations. And, um, and basically, we get uh, on an independent validation uh, test set, uh, we get very nice accuracy metrics in terms of uh, uh, use, applying this classifier then to new data. Um, and then uh, that that's also has ground truth associated with it. So, um, so the point being is that um, we can take advantage of all these features. Um, and even though there are a massive amount of systematic artifacts in the data, um, we can use sophisticated um, com computer science techniques and, and machine learning techniques to, uh, to learn uh, uh, in a machine way how to distinguish um, true positive from false positive mutations. Okay. Good. Um, so, moving on to uh, visualization tools. Um, so we've talked about um, IGV, and um, and of, often, as I've shown, um, visual inspection can reveal obvious artifacts as well. So if you've got a small study, and you're just looking at a few tumors, and you might get, let's say, a list of 100 variants, um, it, it's often um, tractable to just browse them all. Spend the day, spend the two days, and just browse them. You get familiar with the data learn what um, a, a real mutation looks like compared to a false mutation. And that's what we're going to do in the lab. I'm giving you examples of false positives and examples of true positives. And you're going to actually pull them up in IGV and have a look and see for yourself what the differences are. So annotation tools. Um, so one thing we need to do is we need to go from genomic positions uh, which are just coordinates on a chromosome, and want to contextualize those positions in terms of genes. And so one tool that does this very nicely is a tool called Mutation Assessor. It's developed at the uh, Sloan Kettering, um, Memorial Sloan Kettering Institute in, in, in New York. And, um, uh, and there's a paper, and there's a tool, and there's a web interface. And so uh, we'll do that in the lab as well. And basically, we go from genome position information to protein functional impact predictions. Um, whereby you can see precisely where this variant sits on the protein. You can look at that in a 3D confirmation. Um, you can see where in the 3D confirmation of the protein the mutation uh, is affecting the amino acid. Um, you can look at multiple sequence alignments um, to look at for how well conserved that particular amino acid is in the context of evolution um, to see. And so obviously if it's a highly conserved site, that's mutated, uh, the, the probability of uh, functional impact is much higher because uh, you're disrupting something that's been selected for over time. And so uh, it's a very nice tool that I um, that, uh, highly recommend you check out. And um, I use it, again, we, we, we collaborate with this group. And uh, I think, Carrie, how many queries have we done over the years? Probably 500,000 queries. So. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm just going to wrap up with some future considerations. So a question I often get asked, and I'm sure John gets asked this as well, is how much sequence do you need? What's the coverage that you need to sequence a tumor genome? Well, here's a kind of a scary picture, and yet another scary picture about intertumoral heterogeneity. So this is a, a project that I'm leading that um, whereby we're looking at different parts of the same tumor. So we're extracting different um, samples from within the same tumor mass and to, to really measure precisely the extent of mutational heterogeneity within a given tumor. And so here are two cases. So these are two individuals with four samples each. And, um, and so what we did is do, we, we executed the mutation calling um, based on our classifier that I mentioned. And, um, and then we clustered the data um, uh, just with the four cases, just to show how much uh, of the mutational profile is shared amongst those four samples and how much is unique um, or different, you know, not shared amongst the three. So what you can see here is that approximately a third in both cases, um, a third of the mutations uh, is shared. 
It's only a third. Okay, so so you taking one sample, uh, you may be getting a, a slightly more than a third of the mutations in a in a given tumor. That's a bit scary. Um, so so one solution is to sequence deeper. So one can um, because you may have um, some cells from different clones um, that are just sort of uh, rare in different parts of the tumor, and so you may be able to get them by sequence deep, se sequencing deeply. But what I suspect will happen um, is that we'll go beyond this paradigm of one sample per tumor and, and really start to engage in multiple samples per tumor in time and in space. Um, and, uh, and so we can, we can do time series type of experiments, follow uh, patients over time, um, but we can also um, look at uh, distant metastases, and there, there are papers that have, that have looked at um, patients in this way using sequencing, and not from a particular single nucleotide perspective, but, um, but certainly from an architecture perspective, um, uh, using some of the tools that, that you used yesterday. So, so this is a bit of a sobering picture, but also um, uh, shows you how, how much uh, there is to be learned uh, about uh, about the genomes of cancers by by by, by sequencing, and we can um, design experiments to really quantify for the first time the extent of a heterogeneity within a given tumor, um, and that's just uh, I think it's quite exciting that we can actually do this now. Um, so to give you an idea of how accessible this is. So I wrote a grant that um, you know, I, was, I had proposed to do um, five samples per tumor uh, using exome capture technology. This is, this is about a year ago. And the grant was funded uh, and was recently just, just getting initiated now. But now what I can do, um, but, so in one year, what I can do is I can do 10 samples, whole genomes, um, for the same pr price as what I costed out for doing five samples of exomes uh, just a year ago. So, so this is going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Uh, we're approaching probably a $1,000 genome is approaching. Uh, right now we're sitting at about a $5,000 genome. And so these experiments are going to become commoditized. And, and basically, um, even small labs will be able to engage in them. Um, but you have to be prepared that there's, that's going to create an enormous amount of uh, data analysis. And uh, that's, that's both exciting and daunting at the same time. So, Okay, so then finally, uh, some statistical challenges for the future. So uh, I mentioned some of these artifacts, and we really haven't, we've only begun to understand these artifacts. So what's, what's going on in base calling? We've recently noticed a, a, a very systematic error where um, you have a pattern of nucleotides. And whenever you see that pattern of nucleotides, um, there's a sequencing error uh, throughout. Okay, and it's really clean. It's beautiful. It's like, it looks like a, a, a perfect bona fide um, very variant, but it's actually a sequencing error. Um, so these things are going to get discovered over time, and and um, and so we have to be ready to take advantage of them. Um, again, I'll emphasize that the biology of cancer is very complex. Few tools exist specifically for cancer data. Um, this is my mo: is to try to fix this, and um, I've been working extensively on this. So uh, all these properties of copy number alterations, mutational heterogeneity, tumor normal admixture uh, will be determined uh, allelic distributions observed in the data. And finally, um, we're going to have integration uh, problems with, um, with multiple views of a tumor uh, and multiple sampling. So um, to the tumor normal pair uh, paradigm, we have the DNA RNA paradigm where we might see RNA edits or allele specific expression, pre and post treatment pairs. Um, some people are engaged in that type of work in the room here. And multiple samplings of the same tumor. Um, all these um, problems are, are, are extremely interesting and important and also represent new statistical challenges that need to be addressed if we're to fully define uh, cancer mutational landscapes, as I described. Uh, earlier today. So, so with that, I'll conclude this sort of lecture component. And, uh, but before the, I do that, I, it would be remiss not to uh, acknowledge a number of people that have contributed to all the work that I've uh, presented today. Um, and uh, most notably, Sam Aparicio and David Huntsman are my former postdoc advisors and, and now colleagues. And um, they really, uh, I think, have uh, been real le leaders in this field and bold leaders in this field and adopted sequencing technology in a cancer context um, uh, in the Canadian setting uh, uh, very early on and, and uh, really led the way uh, and have had uh, many early successes. 
so they deserve a lot of credit for that. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Gavin Ha and Jari Ding, who are my PhD students, who actually worked a lot on uh, developing some of the lab content uh, for both yesterday and today. And, um, and then I have a, a number of other grad students, um, Andrew McPherson, Anna Chrisanne, Andrew Roth, uh, who all have um, uh, done some of the work that you've uh, seen in the slides. And my collaborator on the Intratumoral Heterogeneity Project is uh, Jessica McAlpine, who's a gynecologic surgeon at uh, the BC Cancer Agency. Finally, uh, Mark O'Mara and Mar Martin Hurst, uh, who really um, uh, worked extremely hard to get a functioning sequencing pipeline going uh, at the Genome Sciences Center and uh, have produced uh, an incredible amount of good quality data for our experiments. And uh, that's a non-trivial exercise uh, to get that uh, data analysis, uh, the data generation pipeline to a point where um, we're getting actually good quality data. Um, so, uh, with that, um, I'd like to also thank the courageous patients who donated their tumor specimens to research. So obviously none of this work can be possible without um, people signing consent forms and saying, yes, I can, um, I give you my permission to use my, my tumor samples uh, for research. So, uh, so none of that, this is possible without them. Okay, so that's where I'll conclude the lecture component and uh, we'll move to the lab.